The views expressed by the host of the In Full Bloom book club series are not necessarily those held by In Full Bloom Media. Our hosts do not claim to be experts on the topics we discuss, but instead will express opinions derived from their own experiences. The In Full Bloom book club is committed to exploring real issues that affect humanity. These conversations may be challenging and heavy, but we believe them to be necessary and hope they will be empathy cultivating and transformative for the host and for all of you. Please remember that these discussions are made for an adult audience, so view at your discretion. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to another episode with Info Bloom Media. Um, here we utilize the transformative power of storytelling to explore and cultivate empathy and inspire positive change. We are currently reading our second novel of the season, Scorpion Fish by Natalie Bocopoulos. And today's episode, we are covering chapters 14 through 20. Okay, ladies. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So let's talk about what are our first impressions of this last half of the book what in the world <laughs> uh, regarding the very abrupt disappearance of Nefele what in the world regarding the last scene what in the world um, there were a few things that reaffirmed some other theories we had regarding kind of what this story is really about that was interesting and I felt like you know we did that, you know, mm -hmm. we put our investigative skills to work. So I was pretty proud of that. Um, but yeah, I was a bit stunned. Everything felt a little abrupt to me. I don't know if you all felt the same way, um, but I'll be honest in saying there wasn't completely a sense of closure regarding the fele and clarity. I don't know. I'm interested in hearing what you all uh, think. I mean, a lot happened in this like very short section. It felt like almost the whole book could have been focused on just this like, you know, <laughs> 20 pages or whatever it was. Because I mean, we had that whole scene of her going into the water, which could, we could spend an hour dissecting in itself. And we had the funeral, we had Nefeli's disappearance in the first part. Her art show is really in this section too, right? like this is the chunk that's her art show like this this whole section was like a huge portion of the book and a huge yeah. portion of like the kind of story we were following because I guess that's yeah. part of the impressions I have for this too is that like there's not like a clear story it's very like here are the sections of these people's lives that we're viewing right now and like the only part that has like a really conclusive like end to it is uh, Nefeli's death. And the only part that has a really conclusive beginning to it is like Mira showing up on in Greece in the first place. So it's like, you know, this very like tiny little portion of everybody's life that we get to see and we get to see a whole lot of it in this very tiny section. Yeah. <laughs> like here's everyone's life like summed up real quick, you know? Even the way Rami left was so abrupt. Right. <laughs> it happened in yeah. a matter of a paragraph. I feel mm -hmm. like it was explaining like, you know, everything that went on with that. Um, yeah, she was like, I wonder if this led to it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, she was just like, I wonder if this led to it. And then Rami's gone. And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. I just uh, think this section, just from the beginning to the end, you just hit with so many different things. And then it's like, you're hit with it and then we move on and then you're hit with something else. There's yeah. never like really like let's sum up everything. It's just nope, here we go. I'm giving it all to you. You know? Um, it starts with the vandalism at the very beginning, which you're just like, okay, let's talk about this, but we don't really go into it look as much as I kind of wanted to. I felt I didn't know if I kind of thought maybe there was something related to that that was like a bigger thing, but it was just it was what it was, you know. So that was interesting. Um, yeah. A little theory on that vandalism. I think it was Nefeli, but that's based Isn't on that like- what thought? Isn't that uh, what Mira thought too? That it was Nefeli? Yeah, that there was like a portion of her where it was like, could she have done this? She definitely could have done this. Hmm, yeah. That, that feels a little on brand though. On brand right. Nefeli. Right. <laughs> yeah. Especially when her whole thing was like, you know, art is uh, moving constantly and its destruction is as beautiful as its yeah. creation and 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just always changing any regardless. Like I just felt like it was just going through a whole evolution on its right. own. So I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't LA. So yeah. <sighs> Ooh, yeah this whole section it was a lot <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was it a lot for sure all right so our first section straight out the text so our first question at one point in the evolution of Nefele's art piece her voice can be heard in the soundscape saying art is not about expression art is about porousness art is a conversation with the dead what do you believe this tells us about how Nefele views her art more generally, let's reflect on the evolution of Nefele's artwork and our story's progress toward her impending disappearance and death. So there's only one part I was really able to like cling on to and try to break down, which was art is about porousness. So when I thought of porousness, I was thinking of being really absorbent. And I was thinking, well, maybe something she might've been trying to say was, Art absorbs our emotions or our, our current state, which I think we can definitely see with her artwork, especially towards the end of her life where she kind of put in the little scorpions here and there, you know, to kind of hint at what she was really going through. Even though it wasn't obvious to us right away, it was to her, it was a piece of her, you know, something that the canvas, her art absorbed from her. So I can see that part. Now the art is a conversation with the dead, that part, I don't know what she meant at all. Does anyone have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so I'm kind of the opposite of you. I didn't get the porousness part at all. That went right over my head. I I will be real upfront. I am <laughs> not good at dissecting art. <laughs> like it's not, I know what it means to me. I like what it means to me, but I can't, like I have a hard time really seeing what the artist means and what the real, mm-hmm. what the artist intends specifically as opposed to what I'm getting from it which I guess is a very American version of looking at art as opposed to a very European version of looking at art Mm -hmm. but um I got the like it's a conversation with the dead part and I guess I mostly got it from Nefeli's part point of view of like the stages she was moving into right she was obviously aware that she was dying she was aware that she was getting close to that point in her life so to me like that is more a hint at the fact that so many of the artists that we respect and so many artists that we study are currently dead and that we're understanding their point of view, you know, past their life that it's already ended and that we're finally getting these messages from them that are just everlasting because they put it into their work in the first place. I like that, Bridget. I like that. And I think that can that ties it together with the porousness, with the art kind of absorbing who these artists were. And then that conversation, you're just, you're kind of speaking to them because that art is them. It's a living representation of who they are. So I really like that. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, and it's like getting to have that conversation with the point that they were at when they they created it too. It's not, you know, who we know them to be. It was who they knew them to be. Yeah. When I was reading about porousness, they were talking about um, the movement or the fluidity of um, liquids going in and out, I thought, if I, if I remember correctly. And so for me, in addition to kind of the art absorbing the life of, or the characteristics of the artist, um, I was thinking it could be vice versa as well, kind of the art informing the artist. Um, I remember Mira saying that the, Nefeli had was in a space where it seemed like her and her art were the same. What are your thoughts about just the progress of her work in general and what that meant to Nefeli and how that's connected to her disappearance and death? Oh, well, before we touch on that, because I've got a thought in my head that I can't get out now and I can't sure. move on because it's in there. Um, what with what you were saying about it moving in and out it almost feels then like her art had the same sickness that that's why she kept putting the scorpions into it because mm-hmm. and this is going real high concept with it but you know mm-hmm. the with the scorpions as so like she viewed the blue scorpions and the blue scorpions blood as her cure right she was injecting herself with it and looking for the cure and it almost feels like she was giving the same thing to her art then that like her art had the same sickness and so she was giving it the same cure and trying to push into it the same like feelings and hopefulness and determination to get better that she was forcing into her own body too Mm -hmm. it just yeah when you said that I was like 
oh but the scorpions like I really like that part yeah yeah Mm -hmm. I mean going real high concept but as far as like what how her art progressed I keep going back to the thought of how she said that um you don't do a portrait of yourself until you're past your 40s I think is what she said and I think that kind of shows how she expects her work to try and grow, to improve throughout her her career and to change without her career within her career is because like by the time you're 40 you should know who you are like you should have like a solid this is me I am this person and be relatively confident in who you are to some degree like if not confident then comfortable and I think that's why she points out that you shouldn't even do a portrait until that age is because that's when you like can accurately define yourself within your work Mm. and so I feel like her her movement throughout her career that we've seen like little bits and pieces of in you know the descriptions of her art was more towards knowing and understanding and reflecting herself in her work more and more. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling with there are so many components so many pieces that I'm trying to like piece together to make the full picture Um, and I just don't think fast enough for it to happen. I'm so (laughs) frustrated. The exhibit definitely seemed like a social commentary, right? And it was meant to be evolving, um, as the artwork evolved, as people interacted with the artwork, even so much as I think certain components of vandalism and certain components of, um, the commentary, you know, about the vandalism were, um, included in the artwork at some point, um, and then I know they were saying at the end, it was, there were photos of like journals she had done since 1970. The main part of the exhibit was that there was like a camera looking out into the streets or something right, like that, right? Yeah. And it was projected. Is that how it worked? Yeah. yeah. So maybe it was some type of commentary on a reflection of society and also a reflection on herself. Um... And obviously, like you all were saying, like Bridget was saying with the scorpion, um, you know, it was, it was, I think, following her journey in some way. Um, It's interesting to note that the evolution of this piece continues after her death, right? Because it's continuously grabbing pictures. So even after she dies, this piece continues to evolve past her life. Mm -hmm. Right. That'd be an important part to note, though that she made something that maybe intentionally she knew would outlive her. Right. Especially because she knew she was dying in that moment. Well, and and I think she knew she was going to commit suicide as well. Like, it seems like it was a very intentional, like, right. spacing of time. That, like, she she created this exhibit. She did her, like, duties around the exhibit that she was expected to do. And then shortly after that, she killed herself. And I think she knew that that was coming, that mm-hmm. she was eventually going to kill herself and that her piece was going to keep, you know, keep evolving and keep adding after she right. died. Yeah. All right. So our second question for straight out the text, what do you make of the final scene of the novel? Mm, yeah. Well, they're sitting next to each other. So that's <laughs> exciting. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. That was my first thought when I read this question. I was like, oh, well, they're sitting there. They're, they're doing the city thing. Um, no, it is. It just, you know, wraps it up so nicely. And it gives us this, um, I, at least the story of Captain Amira, it wraps up very nicely where you're like, well, maybe they'll continue dating. Maybe they'll just be this, but like they get to end in the same way they begin. And that's super pretty and nice and circular. Um, <laughs> But you're yeah. not for it. Right? <laughs> you're not for it. <laughs> I still like have that hard time in my head of like how their relationship developed so quickly. And like I I mentioned it last time and I'll say it again that like I understand that like in times of grief, sometimes it's easier to make those connections quickly when you're both like grieving different things. And mm-hmm. you know, so it, it is nice. I was really hoping they would end up together. I was really hoping they would just be friends. That would just be like a fun little thing they had with like their friendship. But like, this is cool too. So <laughs> like, I don't know. It was nice. It was circular. I was like, cool. They moved next to each other and they did this little smile. And then we were like, happy. So. <laughs> Are you happy, Bridget? <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like more and more throughout the story, the focal po- point started to not be about their relationship so having it end with them 
um, again, seemed like a very intentional choice. I'm trying to wrap my head around what that was. It also left off with Captain being in the narrator's voice, um, which is also interesting, being that Mira is understood to be the main character. Um, I'm trying to make sense of it. One, he described her as looking at him in a conspiratorial way, which to me suggests like, ooh, something up her sleeve, right? So that could maybe be referencing what we were talking about, I think an episode prior, um, about the fact that she was going to be collecting these stories um, in some way, which Bridget, you had made such a brilliant point. And I'm so frustrated with myself because I took it to a very literal place because you were suggesting that this is just an expression of how she thinks, like she's a story collector. And so, but I went off in the direction of, this is what this book actually is. It's a, meant to be a collection of stories. Anyways, it is possible that that is what it is. And maybe that's why she looked at him like, guess what I'm about to do with all these, you know? <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. I'm so confused by that last scene and then they said as if nothing had he said as if nothing had ever happened but of course everything had what is everything I mean I I took it as like very literal like this was how they had begun their journey together like they had met each other just you know sitting side by side with this partition between them and then all of these things happened so they realized that they were connected through Eris and Nefeli and they realized they had like intertwined lives and here's all these things that are happening in their intertwined lives and then it ends and they're still just sitting with like you know now it's a um figurative partition between them they're like just looking out at the waves they're not looking at each other and oh, it feels as if it's like the beginning again but really all of these things have happened between them and within their lives and collective like uh communities and maybe it's it's trying to point out their comfort and peace and what they are to each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but I'm trying to make sense of the significance of that to the entire story. I have an easier time grappling the significance of that moment for their relationship and maybe even for their personal development in their relationships, right? But for the entire story, it's hard for me to piece that together as far as like why we would make that the final scene. And Natalie, this is not, Natalie, this is not a critique of you at all. I'm just suggesting that you uh, have me flabbergasted. I just can't figure it out. Yeah. Um, I kind of think of it can't. as, um, so I love Kurt Vonnegut, so I'm, I kind of go that direction with things a lot, but I kind of think of it as Kurt Vonnegut, who ends a lot of his chapters in one of his books with, and so it goes. And it kind of was that mentality to me of like, Oh, and so life mm -hmm. continues. Like, here's mm -hmm. all these things that have happened. Obviously, everything has happened. Every big thing that it, that's been between them has already, like, moved through its process to some degree. Um, but so it goes. It, it continues on. Life moves forward. And, you know, everything's different, but everything is to some degree still the same because life doesn't really change that much. Hmm. And maybe that's how it ties into the entire story kind of the understanding that Lafelle's artwork is going to go on, right? But, you know, and beyond beyond her and that artwork and that vandalism, there, Athens is still going to be experiencing the issues that they experience, right? And mm -hmm. maybe this is not like a, a pretty, like, you know, bow wrap up type of ending of a story where it's like, oh, and they've learned so much and they've changed so much. Maybe yeah. it's suggesting that, in fact, they they've changed very little well and we view this from like the point of view as 26 year olds or younger if you're asia and lucky uh <laughs> 26 year olds who like you know uh our lives are constantly changing and who we know ourselves to be is constantly changing so how we react to things is also constantly changing like i can think of how i reacted to something at 20 and i go what in the absolute everything were you thinking that was dumb like, I can do that constantly with my past self. But when you're in this stage that they are all in, which is like 40 plus, it, it goes back to what I was saying about Nefeli's um, opinion of when you do your portraits. You do your portraits when you're comfortable with who you are and you know yourself better. So like you're saying, things have changed. 
of course, but they as people have not changed that much because they've been so comfortable with who they are already. They're already, they're already their set people to some degree, right? Like obviously after 40, you still change to some point here and there, but like who you are as a person is relatively set. And even all these traumatic events happening isn't going to like drastically change who they are as people. They're just going to adapt to it in the way that their characteristics and their personality adapts to things like this. Bridget, what does this mean for like the context of the entire story? I mean, could it not be that? That like we're looking at an age that we don't really look at in books very often. Or if we do, we do it in a really dramatic way. We have Meet, Pray, Love, who goes on an entire journey by herself and says like, my entire life changed. But like, realistically you don't change that much once you like have your set person so maybe that is what the whole thing means within the context of the book it's like things happen things change but who you are as a person doesn't always have to like drastically turn into someone else we don't always have to have the main character with Mira turn into an entirely different person with different flaws and you know she doesn't always have to have such a dramatic character growth it can just be shit happens and then we are who we are and we move on. Yeah, so it goes. <laughs> I'm really breaking down, y'all. I'm <laughs> no, you're because I'm just like, it just doesn't resonate with me as like a commentary on age being like what the author ultimately intended. I realistically just mean like this stage of life. Mm-hmm. Like I don't necessarily mean like, oh, this is a book about like what it's like to be 40. Like that's not what right. it's about. But it is mm-hmm. about like this later stage of life and she makes a lot of commentaries about this stage of life where like you know she points out uh how we view our parents during this stage of life and that now that they're the age that they were when they or that their parents were when they were growing up it's you know changed their view to some degree but not really something that came to my head was does transition automatically mean transformation like does that equal the same mm-hmm. thing you know And I think sometimes we assume that it does, but Bridget, you made a good point. They are still the same people. They are, yeah, they went through a huge transition. Life is different, but they're not necessarily that different. So I don't know. And I think that speaks to our theme a little bit too, how in our age, we are going through a lot of transition. And for most of us, we are transforming. So this is something that, is maybe something hard for us to kind of like sit with because we are used to that concept of transformation and we just changing and all that but in this story it's just transition and just getting past that but being mm-hmm. still being that person is you're still intact with who you are does that make sense no that was a beautiful summary of the thing I tried to say and went 20 <laughs> times over myself with no that was beautiful <laughs> and from a societal standpoint, same thing, a exploration of whether like all of these different things that are happening are so different that they're transforming us as a society, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it goes back to the question, like, uh, I think Nefele asked, uh, how will this define us? And I think the suggestion here is that transfer- transition um, and movement through different spaces, different times, different circumstances does not always result in transformation. Yeah. yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. All righty, y'all. We are going to move on to our next segment. Hmm. And how does that make you feel? Our first question is, Mira describes receiving a call from artists after the birth of his daughter. She remarks that she realized she'd forgiven him and that it felt right that he was calling her. She proclaims, this was love too, so open and generous and alive. There are so many ways to love. How is it that we only have one word for it? I might not have been his great love if there was such a thing. That was okay. The demand for reciprocity was bizarre, insane, and impossible. My question is, do you all resonate with what Mira says here? How do you imagine you would have felt in this situation and or reacted in this situation? So I, I go back and forth because of the storyline with this one where like this, this does happen after he cheats on his fiance with her while she is actively pregnant with his child. So I I do, as much as I appreciate this moment, I do kind of feel like it's a little tinged by that fact that like he, they did still have this relationship that was very toxic for a few, 
few months there and this is like the after of that and that's you know it's a little tinged by that for me but I I am a person that forgives people um very easily sometimes too easily I am very quick to move on in high school even I would have like a date where like if I had a grudge with somebody I'd be like all right by this date I gotta be done with those grudges I'm done yeah I was really dramatic about it (laughs) weird I know Um, (laughs) but uh yeah so I I feel that like One, it's like the desire for the forgiveness. It's not just like that easy, like, oh, this is, you know, it's forgiven now, but it's that desire coupled with like the passing of time and the realization of everything about their relationship and all of those things that as a very introspective person, I, I definitely connect with where like, sometimes I do just like realize all of a sudden of like, oh, I forgave that person already. If they called me tomorrow, we could move forward kind of thing. So I hope they're able to like disentangle what's going on between them so that they can just have this very platonic state of love and, you know, get to get to continue to be in each other's lives. They've made it so clear that, you know, even separated by the great distance that they were, that they had this very connected relationship and that they were very supportive of each other and you know confidants and all of those things that go with very tight-knit friendships even so I do hope that like that gets to continue for them and that they're able to disentangle the the romantic side of it for that and I mean I I think they could because they also talked about how they like weren't really exclusive at any period of time because they live so far apart so I just think it's a, it's a very complicated relationship, but I can totally understand how they can get to this point of like forgiveness to where he would even call her at the, after the birth of his child to, you know, exclaim how excited and how happy he is to be part of this family now. Not in love with this part. Um, but I just think it's a decent end to that whole situation, just moving forward. It's just, that's just honestly what I see. It's just moving forward past all that. He has his own life. He, you know, his baby girl and everything. That's beautiful. Um, And I think there's just that, like, regardless of everything you went through in the past, it's just that, that simple love that just, I love you as a person and want to see you happy and just kind of moving forward with your own situation and that you don't hold anything against them or like, you know, carry around that resentment or anything. Um, and that's beautiful that that's that just that just feels like a release of all those feelings that she might have been well that she was carrying around for a while so I really resonated with the mirrors quote saying um, the demand for reciprocity was bizarre insane and impossible and the idea of um, she said this was love too so open generous and alive which I'm not sure if she was referring to Eris's love for his daughter or to their love for each other at this point? Um, Okay. Um, Yeah, I really resonate with that. I think I find myself sometimes on the extremes of love um, between this like feeling like I have unconditional, like boundless love for people, um, this really expansive love for people beyond circumstance with no expectation for reciprocity I actually have this um I have like a vision statement for myself and that's a real goal of mine I love that ideal that idea and I guess that ideal I think that I once read something about the difference between that that real love is watering a flower versus picking a flower picking a flower deals with um possession with a a want for it to provide some experience to you versus worrying a flower it you appreciating it for what it is and wanting it to grow and develop and Mm -hmm. um, I want to have that kind of love for people separate from myself a kind of egoless love um I feel like yeah people are deserving of that uh I don't know. I feel like that feels like a a high form of love to me. But again, I feel like I'm often at the extremes of that. So I often find that I can be very limiting in my love and be very stingy with my love, especially when my feelings get hurt. I could imagine myself in this situation. And I have been in situations where I've seen people who for so long I had so many resentments toward 
and I saw them in this really this moment of desperation or this moment of extreme joy and I really felt genuinely excited and happy for them with or without me regardless of my involvement um and every once in a while I get a taste of that and I feel like that's what I want to work toward but your girl has a big ego and so it's um it's very hard to keep myself aligned with that I often find myself um, putting restrictions on my love, restricting my love in some way. So we are moving on to our last section in the grand scheme. In the back of the book, author Natalie Bakaplaus poses a question for reflection. Um, one of these said questions are as follows. Discuss the differences between the words exile, immigrant, migrant, and refugee. How do you notice them used in this book? How do you notice them used in the media? All right, so I read this question beforehand and I got really excited because I'm an, Engl I'm an English major and I'm all about describing dictation anyway. versus connotation or tendentation. But yeah, so super pumped for this question. Um, <laughs> so it just from that point of view of like, you know, studying the words of the English language and everything, um, it's definitely in the connotation between like exile and refugee versus migrant and immigrant, which migrant and immigrant we assume is of your own choice. It's of your own, you know, personal journey to go into another country or to move forward in your lifestyle and somewhere else where exile and refugee, the connotation is that you had no choice. You were forced out of your home. You were forced out of your situation and into a new one. And you, you know, how, whether or not you had the choice is so, um, is so connected to how you respond to it and how you transition into that next period that it's just so important to me that like that is the that's the difference between the words is that that's that's what binds each one together and what separates them as well is that in some you have a choice if you have the choice then you're moving into a new period and it's still probably going to be pretty hard you know you, you if you're an immigrant, you're probably still going to have some level of culture shock. You might have financial issues. You might have, you know, there's a whole slew of things that might happen as an immigrant that would, don't necessarily reflect the same things that are happening as a refugee. Sure, you could have like financial issues. You could have culture shock. But when they're forced upon you, when you have no choice in the, in the journey that you're on, then the way you're going to respond to that may not be in a positive manner or depending on the person, it might make you like respond in a really resilient manner. My own experience, I moved from Arizona to South Carolina. And obviously that's not, we're still in America. That's not some like giant jump, you know, but like to go from being a person that had really only been on the West coast to going to Charleston, South Carolina, where it's very Southern and it's very old money. Southern is the best way to refer to it. Um, so I grew up in Southern California where like there's definitely this like money aspect to that where it's like, you know, everybody's trying to flash what they have, but it's a new money concept as well. It's very um, flashy and how it shows off its money. It's very like, look at all the experiences we get to do. So moving from that kind of culture into South Carolina was really hard for me. <laughs> it, it was not what I was expecting. And mind you, like I chose that place. I decided I'm going there. And I thought that I was going to respond and be like super resilient and like put myself out there and adapt to this new culture that I was in. And I really didn't. I went through a really heavy depressive period. I really struggled to make friends. I struggled to like find my place within this community where I have friends who immigrate or um, who like were refugees, essentially. They were forced immigration into our country and they responded so much better to changes in their lives than I did. They they embraced American culture and they decided that like that was who they wanted to be and they you know really uh, rolled with it within their personality and who they were and it became part of them. Where like I fought it. Sometimes we think that because we give people the choice of what they're gonna do, they're gonna respond very gratefully and they're gonna respond very like happily and here's this whole thing for them, you know this whole like experience that they got to choose where we expect refugees to have even a harder time and to, to not integrate very well. And we expect integration as well, which is always a problem. I went on a whole long winded thing for this that I think went off of my original thesis that I started with. But um, 
yeah, it's just, it's so interesting to me that even when it's, it's choice versus force is where people go with it and how they, how they go on that journey is so uh, integral to who they are as a person and how they respond to hardships. I wrote down a few notes. Uh, one, I think even before you mentioned some biases we have about the different terms, um, language has the meaning that we give it. I think I've heard like some definitions of language be like you use the term meaning making. I think that we have certain biases for different um, for different words, right? We have connotations, like you were saying. And so, Bridget, I think you admitted in response to the word refugee, you always assume that they're coming from poverty. Um, I believe you mentioned that in the previous episode. Yeah. And so that's kind of a potential bias that you have associated with that term. I think it's interesting to think about how we use those words and how that impacts public opinion. So if we're if we're thinking migrant and immigrant are associated with a choice to move somewhere, then you're seeing individuals, you see people differently than if you're like, oh, these poor people who were forced into this situation, right? So if we're talking about an immigration pro uh, problem in America, we're looking at those individuals as they had a choice and they made the choice to illegally move here or whatever. So we could question whether there actually is a choice. What, what's a choice in this situation? If you're escaping danger, if you're escaping poverty, is that really a choice in the same way? You know, is there that amount of agency involved when you're making that decision? The terms that we use are reflective of how we think about the situation and vice versa. And I think the language that we use can also be reflective of in turn how we feel about individuals who are prescribed that label. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I agree with you. When you add that connotation, you change the way you empathize for that person that is migrating. And I just think regardless of the reason for them moving wherever, it's still, that's a hard journey, one, to even one, make that decision to come somewhere else. And that's, that's a transition that you have to make. I felt really sorry for Rami for a, a big part of it. But then once I got to know the dynamic with him and um, being in a family with Fady, I was like, he's really embraced and very loved. And it just was hard to feel sorry for him. And then him going to the school and, you know, helping out at the school, I was just like, he's like really in there and really, you know, intertwined in the whole culture. And just, you don't see him in that same way when you think of a refugee like that. Oh, they are, you know, we feel sorry for them. I didn't feel sorry for Rami at all. You know, I, thought he was just one a really great character but also just I didn't see that sad pity that I would think you would want to kind of put behind that connotation of a refugee so yeah that's just kind of my two cents into that oh that's an interesting point because it it they do integrate him so much into their culture that like you're saying you don't feel that pity and that's kind of a you know a talking point in its own self is that like should we be offering pity to mm -hmm. refugees is that what they want or do they just need you know the leg up to get into the better situations that they're looking for whether that requires integration or not in just our discussion it seems like they offer the complexity and the wholeness of these characters with these labels and I wonder if Nally wants to offer a peer into that right so instead of seeing people who are exiled as um you know, these depraved individuals, you're seeing someone who we connect with, who we see as an empowered woman, an independent woman, this revolutionary in her own right. That's the, um, the association that we're now making with the word exile. With refugee, we're seeing an intelligent, um, you know, uh, helpful, um, you know, not this individual who is constantly on the receiving end of things, someone who's able to give back and to contribute as well. That's what we're now associating with the word refugee. With the migrant, where we're at, we're thinking migrant in this case is the person with the most agency. There's a lot of a sense of struggle that um, we're seeing Mira deal with as a result of having been in these different places and then adjusting to where she is now and all of that. And so again, we're get we're offered a look at the complexity of all of these um these identities yeah yeah absolutely and I believe um Fady is the immigrant in this as yes. well 
right. I was just thinking that. Yeah, yep. yeah, sure. that he's our example of an immigrant, of this person that's come in and built his own family and built his own life and has a very successful career in which he makes mm-hmm. like very beautiful musical instruments and, mm-hmm. you know, is this very um, contributing member of his family and of society, which is, yeah. you know, very different than sometimes we get um, in America when the media presents like an immigrant to us. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, that's a, it's a beautiful uh, connection there as well of like this very complex person. I'm glad we ended on this one. Yeah, thank you, uh, Natalie Bacaplaus for providing, uh, she does provide a list of questions in the back of her book that are, um, are all pretty thought provoking. So uh, thank you for that, Natalie. And I hope that um, the tribe, members of our tribe will explore those as well. Thank you, host, for your valuable contribution today. And thank you, Chai, for joining us. We value you so much. We hope that you have found this conversation informative, enlightening, inspiring, encouraging, and all of the above. Please join us for our season wrap-up where we'll be discussing both of the novels that we explored this season. Interested in joining the discussion? See the description box for how you can join our Facebook group. We'd love to hear from you. And if you feel so inspired, be sure to subscribe, comment, and share. You, our community, are a large part of how we'll reach our mission for creating a more connected and compassionate society. Thank you all again, and join us next time. There's always room for you here.